namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang Thamang Sankhang Namasami So for a few uh, opening reflections on this um, beginning of our time together on this uh, retreat for the next 10 days uh, I realize that many of you have come quite long distances or at least have been uh, very active wrapping up your lives in order to, to get here, so I'll try not to, to go on for half the night <laughs> out of compassion, but just to uh, bring in uh, into consciousness a few uh, fundamental themes and to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the, uh, the aim or, or one of the um, um, in central intentions uh, for this retreat and uh, the theme that uh, I thought it would be uh, useful to to offer. So, as you will all have noticed, uh, probably, <laughs> hopefully, you noticed uh, on the um, information about this retreat, uh, the title is uh, "Dependent Origination and the Cycles of Addiction." So, some of you might have found that a bit daunting. Others uh, might have thought, "Oh, sign me up." <laughs> And some of you might have thought, what? <laughs> oh, well, it's a retreat in July, you know, I'll go anyway, whatever it's about. Uh, and so whatever your particular interest or intention uh, might have been, uh, hopefully this will be a, uh, a time to uh, reflect on the teachings and to explore the nature of mind and to see how um, our experience uh, uh, of happiness, unhappiness, um, our experiences of, of suffering and and uh, peace and freedom are uh, conditioned by the uh, the way that we handle the mind. And so, essentially, what uh, I'd like to explore is how uh, crucial, how central uh, our attitude is to the way that we uh, we work with perceptions, the way we work with thoughts or emotions, memories, and that uh, it's really our attitude that makes all the difference. Uh, the um, uh, during the, this time, I, I'll uh, explore some of the the themes of dependent origination. Some of you, this might be a familiar subject. You, you've been looking at Buddhist teachings for many decades. This might be a, a familiar area to you. For others, it might be uh, extremely um, uh, new or completely unknown. So you think, well, <laughs> what is this dependent origination? Um, and uh, so um, I will uh, talk about the basic uh, uh, pattern that the Buddha described in this particular teaching and um, uh, say explore some of the, the, uh, uh, the central terms, the central concepts. And it can seem a bit uh, so inter uh, intricate or over-theoretical uh, intellectual. So I'd like to say from the outset, my, my intention is not to just create a blizzard of words and concepts that uh, just um, overwhelm the mind uh, and uh, are, are just sort of, a, uh, uh, sort of an, an intricate and complex and marvelous pattern but which is completely useless, like a sort of wonderful objet d'art <laughs> that sits in the middle of your living room and doesn't actually do anything but it's kind of wow. <laughs> uh, it creates the wow feeling when you, you look at it but you can't really use it for anything. So I want to avoid that. And uh, to emphasize that these teachings on dependent origination, even though they might seem a bit conceptual or a bit, um, uh, say, complex, um, that uh, they are essentially uh, aimed at um, being a practical guide to understanding our mind and learning how to not create suffering, in short. Um, the, uh, the the classical rendition of the um, of the pattern of dependent origination has uh, eleven or twelve different um, uh, 
connected qualities uh, joined together in a in a relational uh, pattern, a, 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 a relational sequence, and so um, it's a there is a lot of information that could be put across. But uh, uh, I will make my best effort in, the, in terms of what I teach and in the dialogues and the questions and answers and the times for the interviews, try and keep it as um, uh, as practical and as accessible as possible. Uh, because you know, that's what the, the Buddha gave his teachings for. He was a, a pragmatist. He was more like a a, um, uh, yeah, a doctor who's, you know, the, the work of the doctor being to cure people. <laughs> Uh, rather than being a theoretician, you know, the Buddha was, was was very good at explaining things, but he wasn't just doing that in order to have wonderful theories about the universe, but helping people to be cured, you know, helping us to break free of the experience of, of uh, insecurity, of uh, alienation, the experiences of, of suffering and uh, uh, confinement and um, stress that we, we as human beings can experience uh, so easily and so regularly during our lives. Uh, in, uh, in brief, what we are uh, with this, this pattern of dependent origination, it's talking about how, uh, uh, how it is that we experience um, unhappiness and how we get stuck into the, uh, the cycles of uh, of say continually getting caught in in the same habits and making the same mistakes. Now, some of you might have signed up for this retreat and thinking, well, I don't really have a, an addiction problem. You know, I'm not addicted to cigarettes or uh, alcohol or pornography or chocolate cake. Yeah, but uh, I don't have an addiction problem. But I would say that the, the whole Buddha's teaching is uh, was given because we all have an addiction problem. That we're addicted to rebirth. That uh, we are, uh, and that might sound a bit metaphysical <laughs> to some people, but uh, what that that means is that uh, we uh, the the very reason, or this, in 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 terms of Buddhist philosophy, the very reason that we are born, that we come in, we come into the world, that we are say born as human beings, is because uh, our uh, our minds, our hearts are still stuck on particular. Um, likes, dislikes, familiarities, uh, opinions, associations, and the degree to which the mind is, is attached, is, is stuck, the, the degree to which it clings to um, what we love, what we hate, what is familiar, to our, our views and opinions, our nationality, our family, our gender, our uh, pleasant and painful experiences, the, the degree to which there is uh, clinging, that, uh, that that's exactly the degree to which the um, the, the heart is impelled to, to get born again. And when I say being born again, it doesn't just mean appearing in a, in a human body, but how um, we repeat the same patterns day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. So within traditional classical Buddhist philosophy, it does also refer to um, those patterns appearing across lifetimes. Um, but uh, I, uh, in, when talking about rebirth, and uh, and uh, the patterns of dependent origination, I I think it's more helpful to uh, say uh, focus in on how those those teachings, how those patterns refer to our day to day, moment to moment experience, rather than uh, across uh, well, one lifetime to another. You know that that, uh, that um, is a uh, say a, a more practical and realistic, you know, helpful way of relating to to these teachings. In the uh, in the classical literature, you know, so because sometimes if you if you read up, maybe some of you are doing a bit of reading. You, know, you went onto Wikipedia and looked up dependent origination just to see what you signed up for, <laughs> or that you'd uh, been looking in your own uh, Buddhist books, and you might think, well, some people say that it's talking about the past life, present life, and future life, and that that's what the, these um, patterns, the pattern of dependent origination, is describing. And then, but somebody else vehemently says, "No, no, no, that's not it. It's actually just talking about your moment-to-moment -moment experience." You know, this three lifetime theory is totally wrong. And actually, what it really means, what the Buddha really meant, <laughs> was it's talking about how the mind gets reborn into likes and dislikes, views and opinions, uh, loves and hates, and so on. And 
if you've been confused by that, or if you've been uh, say come across those differences of opinion, uh, in a way, it's, uh, it, it, it uh, shouldn't be confusing because both are true, and that uh, it's like a, the the pattern of dependent origination. It, uh, it both applies on a very small level, from moment to moment, uh, second by second experience, and also applies over you know, a day, a week, a month, or, and over lifetimes, over you know, many lifetimes. That the same pattern. Um, say applies whether it's on a small scale, medium scale, a large scale. And if you want a technical term to play with, <laughs> this is called scale invariance. Blind you with science already. <laughs> so that's the same thing why, why a, a nerve has the silhouette of a tree. So a nerve is called a dendrite, after the Greek word dendron, which means tree. So if you look at the, the outline of a nerve ending, like a pain nerve, it looks like a tree. Um, so that's why it's called a dendrite. <laughs> because it has the shape of a tree, and the silhouette of a tree is also like the silhouette or the, the shape of a river delta. So uh, you say whether a river delta is much bigger than a tree, and a tree is much bigger than a nerve ending, but the pattern is, is pretty much the same on those different scales. So in exactly the same way, you can look at the, the pattern described by the Buddha's teachings of dependent origination on a small scale, like microscopic scale, medium scale, large scale, and the same pattern applies on all these different levels. Now, uh, the, um, the emphasis that Ajahn Chah gave, and, and also his um, uh, contemporary, Ajahn Buddhadasa, another very well-known and highly respected um, uh, uh, Dharma teacher, Buddhist monk in, in Thailand, was on the moment-by-moment -moment experience uh, that, uh, that this pattern refers to. So that's what I, I like to focus on, as I said, during this retreat. And um, one very... Um, of compelling image, or, or, or uh, say a helpful image that Ajahn Chah used a few times, was uh, to say, you know, when you look at the books and you know, all the different elements, the, the 12 links of the dependent origination, they're all laid out, you know, it all looks you know, kind of distinct. There's ignorance, that conditions uh, uh, formations, formations condition consciousness, so on, you know, all the way through to, um, uh, to you know, birth, aging, and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. You have these, you know, these 12 links, um, uh, or one neatly after another. And he said, well, in the book, you know, it's all laid out over several pages, and you can see, okay, this is what ignorance is. This is what formation is. This is what consciousness is. He says, but when you experience it, he said, um, it all happens very, very fast. And he said, to, to be able to recognize all the different links of dependent origination, he says, it's like falling out of a tree and counting the branches on the way down. <laughs> says, you know, it happens very, very quick, so you can't, most of the time, you can't catch all the different stages of the process. But what you know is, thud, ow! <laughs> You've hit the ground and it hurts. <laughs> so uh, he's a very practical teacher in that respect. And so that... Um, uh, you know, uh, um, the um, help, uh, you know, the the process whereby the the mind loses um, its clear attention, where we get lost, uh, caught up in something, where there is avijja, ignorance, not seeing clearly, and then the connection with, uh, of that with suddenly uh, feeling ow, <laughs> the mind uh, experiencing frustration or suffering or you know, or uh, uh, insecurity, whatever form the that feeling of, of dukkha of unsatisfactoriness might take uh, it, it most of the time it does happen very very quickly like falling out of a tree and thud you know all you know is ow that hurts but the usefulness of learning all the different you know the different links the 12 different um, constituent parts of this process is so that uh, the more uh, the more we are able to understand that the more we're able to in a sense explore how that process works and the more we're able to explore it and and see it uh, uh yeah kind of with a a, a, a a close attention with a with the magnification turned up a bit <laughs> and the speed sort of slowed down a bit through uh, living quietly, living together in the retreat situation, develop, uh, practicing meditation together each day, that uh, we're able to slow things down, look a bit more clearly, and then uh, the more we're able to see clearly, and then we are able to understand how these different elements work together, and then through that understanding, then we are much more able to, to um, free the heart from um, being caught up in that process. 
So essentially, what uh, what the, the the process of, of dependent origination describes is how, uh, when there is ignorance, um, and the, the Buddhist use of the word ignorance doesn't mean not knowing all the facts in Wikipedia. It uh, it specifically means not seeing clearly. Vijja is knowing or awareness. Avijja is not knowing or unawareness, not not seeing clearly. So. Um, when there is full mindfulness and awareness, then we say there is vijja. And when that, that drifts because we're, we're dozing off or we're caught up in a thought or a mood or a, a plan, uh, then there's avijja. The, the mind is not seeing clearly. It's caught up in a like, a dislike, an opinion, or, or just dozing. <laughs> so when the, the mind, it, when there is a lack of mindfulness, then uh, it describes how we then very easily the attention gets caught up in what we see here, smell, taste, touch, it gets caught up in the sense world and then the feelings of like and dislike that are associated with that. Then when um, when the mind gets caught in the feeling of, of pleasure, uh, then uh, there is uh, the tendency to want more of that. So there's the uh, um, the way that the mind takes hold of, of, uh, of a pleasant feeling and wants to to get more of it, or the reverse, the mind experiences a unpleasant feeling, a painful feeling, and wants to get away from it. So this, uh, and we'll explore this uh, uh, a fair amount during the coming days. This is what is called the the bridge between feeling and craving. This is a this is the the the, the key point uh, in the whole process because this is um, in a way where the trouble really starts. <laughs> Where we we create the greatest qualities of uh, of stress or tension within ourselves is uh, in that area where the feeling of like transforms into I want, or the feeling of I dislike is turns into I can't stand or I can't bear it. And then the the process describes how when there is that the mind grasps a feeling, say of like, and follows uh, that craving, then how quickly the the attention gets drawn into that. And uh, the universe shrinks to that single sort of desire object, the thing that the, is, we're craving for. All the rest of the world gets screened out. And then how, in taking hold of that, that object, then investing our sense of hope or um, ownership or, or um, uh, say, uh, our kind of um, uh, our sense of identity in that, that object, that thing that we've, we've chased after, whether it's... Uh, yeah, uh, an, an ordinary sense, you know, it's a familiar sense desire object like a cigarette or a piece of uh, pizza or a um, a drink, uh, or whether it's something more subtle, whether it's uh, grasping hold of a, a beautiful mind state, or grasping hold of a pleasant memory, or uh, grasping uh, the um, the the resentment of a, a, a of a big you know, of a irritation at a a um, corrupt politician, and <laughs> you, you know, often our attachments. What we really love <laughs> is our pet peeves, you know, and uh, that uh, in that absorption, then we are, are uh, you know, creating the uh, uh, say the, a commitment to that, an identification with that. That becomes the most important thing for us in that that uh, uh, full commitment, so in our Buddhist jargon we call this becoming, bhava, and then uh, bhava leads to jati, birth, and uh, there's an, a, a full absorption, a commitment to that thing that we've chased after, a thing that we're resenting. Um, and then how that leads then to the, the experience of, of uh, alienation, of, uh, of insecurity, incompleteness, disappointment, that um, that <coughs> that uh, desire object it, it was pleasant for a moment there was a thrill when we actually got it but then after a while it ceased to satisfy and leaves us feeling disappointed or that we were we were going to give that up <laughs> we were going this is the 15th time we stopped smoking and that uh, even though that was it was that first drag was really satisfying think, yes why did i ever bother giving this up then halfway down the cigarette you realize i remember <laughs> And uh, so that that feeling of of, uh, of regret, of sorrow, alien, of uh, insecurity, incompleteness, uh, this is what we call in again in Buddhist jargon dukkha. Very easy 
become a very familiar term if you're not familiar with it already. And then how uh, the uh, the that experience of dukkha, that feeling of incompleteness, or a feeling of disappointment, or self-criticism, or, or sadness, uh, how that then conditions the, the whole process. Because if the mind gets lost in that, um, and you know, the, the quality of not seeing clearly is, is sort of stoked by that, where the mind absorbs into um, that feeling of self-hatred, or, or regret, or feelings of, of failure, or, or disappointment. Yeah, it really, you had so much hopes for that, that wonderful new film you were going to watch, it's going to be so great. And then, <sighs> that, uh, uh, if that's not understood, if that's not seen clearly, then that feeds the, the, uh, the quality of ignorance. It, it makes us uh, uh, less mindful, we see less clearly, and so then that creates the conditions whereby we're uh, more easily pulled into the next the next wave of that which is attractive or that which is irritating that which is say um, uh, we're habituated to and so uh, we find ourselves repeating the same habits uh, getting lost in the the same patterns you know, over and over again so this is just a, a thumbnail sketch of some of these themes and uh, so we'll be looking at these different elements of that cycle in a in a bit more detail as the, as the days go by, but um, uh, this is the the, the basic uh, sort of building blocks of of dependent origination and why it feeds the cycle of addiction. Because uh, what happens is that, as probably most of us know, <laughs> whatever our our, uh, our sort of uh, drug of choice happens to be. Whether you're addicted to something you know, very chemical like like uh, tobacco or, or alcohol, or, or whether you're addicted to something um, more more subtle or more emotional like addicted to success or uh, affection, or um, being a, a um, uh, say a, a useful person, it can be uh, more subtle objects of uh, that we are addicted to. Just to even it's the feeling of identity. That uh, what happens for us is that when we experience that feeling of, of um, disappointment, when we are, uh, say, uh, experiencing that quality of dukkha, then we're not seeing clearly. We're, we're, not, uh, we're not fully aware of that. We're not fully cognizing how, uh, how the whole picture is. And so what happens is that the uh, something in the mind is sort of remembering the last time that we felt good. So that uh, in that whole process, uh, the moment of, of maximal, maximum thrill or the maximum satisfaction is when you're, you're chasing after a desire object. You're kind of almost, you've almost got it, but you haven't quite. And um, this is the, what we call becoming, where you've, you've kind of chased after you're chasing after something, and you know you're going to get it, but you haven't got it quite yet. This is um, they, when they've, uh, uh, and I often mention this, um, these kind of experiments because it, uh, it reveals, I think, a, 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 an experience most of us have had, where when they they rig uh, rig people up with um, galvanic skin um, response measures so that they can test the the amount of, of sweat or excitement in the body that when they send and they send people shopping and uh, or uh, or show them some kind of you know, interesting or exciting um, film or pictures so that when you go shopping the moment of maximum excitement is just before you get the product that you want so that as you you hand over the money and you and the the person behind the counter is about to give you the thing that you're buying that's when you're most excited. That's when the, 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 your sort of happiness level is, is is greatest. And actually receiving the object, the moment of ownership is already a disappointment. It's already kind of... A, but where you're most... Uh, the, the, the thrill is biggest is the moment just before getting what you want. And this, uh, they, they've uh, studied this many times over in all sorts of different circumstances. And even A.A. A. Milne, in, for those of you who are familiar with the house at Pooh Corner, will remember... There's a certain point where Pooh says, actually, there's, when he says, well, the best thing in the world is honey. I think he's talking with, with Piglet at the time. And he says, you know, Piglet, the best thing in the world is honey. 
And then he thinks for a moment and says, well, actually, no, the, the best thing in the world isn't honey. The best thing in the world is when you've got a pot of honey and you know that you're, you're going to be able to eat it, but you haven't quite started on it yet. <laughs> That's the very best. So uh, even Pooh had this insight into the <laughs> dependent origination and the becoming process. But, uh, I, can, I can give you a precise quote uh, <laughs> later on if you like. So this is, uh, I feel this is a very useful thing to, to understand because what we get addicted to or that moment of most, of most satisfaction is not getting what we want, it's when we know we're going to get what we want, we haven't quite got it yet, so that we're absorbed in the promise, but the, uh, uh, and, the and it's that promise of yes, that's, that's the thing that is the most um, potent uh, uh, drug, <laughs> the... Uh, the that becoming uh, and uh, it's uh, i feel it's it's a, there's a message right there that already as soon as you get the thing that you want you you're already disappointed uh, or getting becoming disappointed that, uh, that the thrill is in that that promise and this happens in in all it's not just in going shopping <laughs> but in, in uh in all of our in many many aspects of our lives it's, it's that sense of um the the thing that we wish for and uh, being uh, is is close by it's just about to be uh, acquired and we don't realize at that point that we're absorbing into that thrill so uh, when we are uh, when we've acquired what we wanted or we've you know, had a good rant at the the thing that we're annoyed annoyed at we've we've uh, torn the politician apart you know <laughs> uh, you know happily uh, in our living room yeah you know, and we had a, a, a good uh, uh, a good grumble, whatever it might be that we've, we've satisfied that, that craving with, then uh, we experience that feeling of, of incompleteness or, uh, or disappointment, uh, self-criticism, getting having got lost in that again, then something in the mind remembers the last time that we felt good. There's something that uh, in your feeling kind of lonely and is still a bit hungry, even though you've already finished off the you know, one tub of ice cream. <laughs> You feel the urge to keep tidying the fridge, <laughs> but, uh, and that uh, something is just is hunting for a um, to, for something to get away from that you know, lonely, incomplete, unsatisfied feeling. So something in the mind remembers the last time that we felt good, fully good, and it uh, uh, it goes to that moment of becoming. It goes to that. Well, that last pot of honey was. <laughs> was like that, that, uh, that conditions the mind so that the next time a, a perception floats by, like, oh, I know, in the, in the freezer, I've got, I have got another tub in the freezer, <laughs> oh. You know, even though the rational mind says, look, you've already had, you know, <laughs> half a gallon of ice cream, you really don't need any more. But then this is not, the, the, the desire systems do not work according to reason. <laughs> It's a, a an instinctual reptile brain process. It's not it's not a kind of neocortex, you know, rational rational brain thing, and so that the the mind is is um, tricked, and uh, and is uh, then conditioned by the 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 effect of the last time we felt good or the last time there was that yes <laughs> feeling, and so then. It's drawn back to repeating that same pattern. You know, the last time that you felt good was when you you say. And I'm not trying to just focus on ice cream. So please, to the cooks department, I'm not. <laughs> no need to go out shopping, especially for. I'm just using this as a random example. That uh, uh, Ajahn Sajita once made the mistake of of using um, cream donuts as an example in a talk like this. And the next morning, you know, several of the Anagarikas had been out and hit the bakery shop in North London. And early next morning, Amravati there on the, on the uh, servery in the sala was a whole slew of cream donuts. So, please don't. <laughs> this is just random examples to 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 be using. But to what happens is the mind remembers. Oh, the last time I felt good was when I was hauling that that uh, that uh, that tub of of ice cream out of the fridge, or I was, you know, having that smoke, or I was having that, that uh, rant to the politician, and so then we just end up going back there again, because that was the last time we felt good. 
even though part of our mind is saying, well, this is ridiculous, this didn't work last time either, <laughs> so why am I doing this again? But, uh, it, it, uh, as I said, it's not a rational process, and in order to learn how the rebirth um, patterns work, uh, we have to get familiar with uh, the non-rational aspects of our being, to, to the instinctual uh, aversions and attractions, uh, compulsions, that come from the the reptile brain, that the uh, feelings of, of uh, craving, feelings of aversion, feelings about territory, uh, these are all coming from our uh, you know, very um, primordial areas of our of our being, our, our instinctual nature. So it, it uh, it's important uh, to to use the meditation and the time that we have together to explore uh, and understand that that um, sort of instinctual and reactive non-conceptual uh, areas of, of our being and uh, the wonderful one of the wonderful things about these teachings is even though they they can come across as uh, quite conceptual or or, um, or heady uh, you know say complex in terms of ideas or words they're designed or their their aim is to help us understand this very wordless, <laughs> An, an instinctual realm of our experience to understand that to learn how to to uh, to uh, say see into its its mechanisms its workings and then through that seeing then to help the heart to be free from that now the um, uh, in the retreat as most of you will be fully aware now that we have a, a structure of um, the routine and uh, the uh, standard of noble silence uh, the um, uh, the the structures of, of uh, the um, precepts that uh, everyone is expected to uh, to live by and to be guided by and um, uh, and so one of the the helpful ways of understanding you know, this framework that we are offered for the for the retreat um, it can come across as a, a long list of you know don't do this don't do this don't do this don't do that and uh, you know you're not allowed to go over there you're not allowed to talk you're not allowed to uh, to uh, uh, to have snacks and uh, you're not allowed to to dig into that uh, uh, <laughs> emergency supply of of um, of uh, Ice cream. <laughs> I was trying to think of those uh, those those kind of uh, um, energy bars. That's right. That you got stashed away in the bottom of your bag. That uh, you know all these things are verboten, um, and so that it can it, it can come across as the the, the structure or, or the the precepts. These are just uh, like rules that you have to obey, but. Uh, it's not just that's not just the way that they work that the precepts and the, the the routine and the structures of the retreat there uh, there it's important to recognize that these are also uh, very direct supports for the meditation and that uh, they are, are uh, they are, uh, are not just simply uh, there to to create a, a structure for our behavior uh, but it's uh, very directly uh, a, a, a support for learning to see those move, movements of the mind of, of irritation or impatience or a craving and to be able to to uh, uh, say witness those observe those and to understand those more directly so I was reflecting on this uh, this retreat and the, the theme earlier today and I, I remembered uh, it's, it's a story I often tell because it was really my first experience of Buddhist meditation, the first day in the monastery in Thailand, um, feels like 150 years ago, <laughs> it was actually, let's see, what, 35 years ago, um, and so I'd never heard of, uh, I mean, I'd heard of the Buddha, but I didn't know anything about Buddhism, I thought the Buddha was from China, uh, and uh, the day before I got to the monastery, I'd never heard of, of Theravada or Mahayana Buddhism, I'd never heard of Ajahn Chah, I didn't know... Uh, never heard of mindfulness of breathing or you know, any of these sort of basic um, uh, say uh, uh, themes of, of Buddhist teaching or, or these some teachers or, or even this particular lineage of Buddhism. So I was very unfamiliar with the whole field, 
So when I arrived in the monastery and uh, um, I was sort of asked to stay for a few days, and the um, the abbot gave me the sort of outline of, of the the routine and the the, you know, the morning the the, the morning wake up bell went at three o'clock. I thought they had a different kind of time system there, so that maybe he meant like the third watch, like you know, which would probably be something like something normal and realistic, like six in the morning maybe. Because three in the morning was a late night, not a not an early not an early morning to me. So. But uh, you know that uh, he sort of laid out the basic um, standards for the monastery, um, but did, hadn't really explained anything about meditation. So um, the evening sitting was coming around, and and so I was um, asking one of the the novices, one of the, the um, Anagarika, okay, well, so you know, what, what do you what do you do with the meditation? What's you know, what's the um, uh, what's the the uh, the method or what what are you supposed to do uh, during that time or, or how do you meditate? So he he gave me um, sort of a basic outline of, uh, of mindfulness of breathing, how to bring the attention to the breath, and um, one of the things that uh, he also explained about was the uh, the Buddha's teaching on the four noble truths, and um, and in this you know, one of the things he said was you know that. The reason why we uh, we are unhappy, or the reason why we uh, we suffer, um, is because of the mind getting caught in desire. And I said, "Well, I don't suffer. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine." Because <laughs> that was my favoured self-image. That you know, I'm a, I'm a happy I'm a happy person. And uh, uh, he said, "Well, you might think you are, but uh, you know, actually." There's also a lot of uh, a lot of suffering in life, and I thought, oh, what a negative character! Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't understand anything. Yeah. Uh, and so, anyway, I, I had a lot of this doubt, and this didn't sound realistic or helpful to me at all. Um, but uh, then he explained, says, you know, the reason why we experience uh, unhappiness or suffering is because you know, the mind gets caught in in desire. You know, when you want something and you can't get it. Then you experience uh, disappointment or, or frustration. You can't get what you want, and um, I certainly had experienced that <laughs> you know, many times. And, and I thought, well, with desire, either you get what you want and you're satisfied for a bit, and then it wears out, or you don't get what you want, and then you're you're um, you're unsatisfied straight away. So I thought, well, maybe there's some sense in this. Uh, but then he said something very very helpful, which was, uh, he said, you know. Well, he's Australian, so he, had a, he sort of did it with an Australian accent. <laughs> Desire is a liar. <laughs> Not a lawyer, a liar. So, Desire is a liar. And uh, <clears throat> so he said, you know, when the mind says, that, you know, I want something, I've got to have something, you shouldn't consider that it's telling the truth. It's just, the, what, it's just the, an impulse that the mind's coming up with, and you don't have to go along with it. But if you learn to just watch that, um, then you uh, and you recognize that it's it's a lie and you don't get caught in it then uh, you you don't create the the feeling of, of disappointment or, or, or lack and, and you find that you're much more able to be content and, and happy with the way things are so I thought well but you still haven't got what you wanted <laughs> so I had a, I couldn't really make out what he was saying it didn't really make a lot of sense but uh, I thought well I'll try I'll give it a try so then the meditation began, and um, I was. Uh, this was also my introduction to no no food in the evening, and so that uh, uh, that was the uh, you know the standard. If you're staying in the monastery, you follow the monastery routine, and there's no food in the afternoon or evening. So uh, part of the way through the meditation, there's this rumble in my stomach, and and the thought, hmm, I really fancy a piece of pineapple. So I've been I've been living on the beach in Phuket, and uh, they really very uh, fine local pineapples there, so I got addicted to the uh, to the uh, local fruit supply. No hints either to the kitchen, please. Uh, this is not just another random example. Uh, but this is the case. It was uh, so the thought crossed my mind. Wow, I really fancy a piece of pineapple. I thought, ah, but they don't. You know, they don't allow anyone to to eat here in the evening, so that's not going to be possible. And I thought, ah, this is one of those desires. Now, what did he say about this? So. Okay, there's a feeling of, of desire. Right, I want some pineapple. Yeah, but I haven't got any. <laughs> so, uh, 
so so I ha I haven't got what I wanted, and I recognise that. Well, well, how is this helpful? <laughs> this is, this is, I, you know, I want some pineapple. I haven't got any. So, yeah, you know, okay. So I haven't got any pineapple. So what? So at that point, I was very uh, unsatisfied with, and seemed like a kind of pointless teaching, and, and didn't make much sense. Then about five minutes later. Um, my mind had got distracted, uh, caught up with another train of thought, and uh, and I realised, oh, I've completely forgotten that I wanted some pineapple, because my mind was was drifting off in some other direction. So then I had the very interesting realisation, the interesting thought: ah, I didn't get the pineapple, and nothing is missing. So that uh, I realised, ah, five minutes ago. I was lacking pineapple, so my life was incomplete. I didn't get the pineapple, and then five minutes later, I didn't get the pineapple, but now the pineapple is not missing. You follow? So then it was like this very loud... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, the bells went off and the light came on. Like, ah, that is significant. <laughs> I didn't get the pineapple and nothing is missing. So then I, it suddenly dawned on me, oh, that's what he meant, that it was lying, that uh, the desire was, was a lie, because it was saying, you will not be complete unless you get some pineapple. You need, you need pineapple, I've got to have. And at that moment, I said, yeah, right. I believe that. And I felt like I was, uh, I was, my life was incomplete because I didn't have any pineapple. I've got, I want some, I've got to have some, I haven't got any, this is not good. And then that recognition, ah, I didn't get the pineapple, and right now, absolutely nothing is missing. So, ah, it was a lie. <laughs> it was just an impression that, that arose in the mind. So this is a, just a simple example of how the precept of not eating in the evening, um, say, for example, it will present us many opportunities to reflect on that. When the mind goes, oh, how did he know that I've got a, an energy bar in the bottom of my bag? Six energy bars in the bottom of my bag. And, uh, actually, I, well, I hadn't thought about those, but now he reminds me. You know, so that uh, as the mind moves towards those kind of objects, and says, so like, "Ah, this is desire." The the mind is saying, "I need," but actually, I really do need. And ah, this is the mind coming up with a convincing case that I got to have this or that, or I can't stand. I got to get away from, and. To be able and using the limits of the precepts, the, re, the restraint on speech, the restraint on eating, the restraint on the routine, you know, showing up to the sittings on time, um, being content with the, the the dwelling place that you've been offered, the place in the dormitory or place the, the, the room you're sharing with people, that uh, rather than oh I, this isn't right, I want some, uh, you know, I, I want that, <laughs> or uh, uh, the mind chasing after things in that way, to be able to, to use the limits, the structure and the, the precepts to say, ah, here's a really good opportunity to, to look at the mind's uh, uh, habit of chasing after a desire, chasing after an aversion. This is a, a, a an opportunity to uh, explore exactly these themes that we're, we're looking at during this retreat time. And uh, so that, uh, and we can see how when we make that effort to not follow the the craving, but to to know, ah, this is a feeling. This is a very potent feeling, perhaps it's very strong, but it's just a feeling. And the mind is making a strong case for I can't stand this. I've got to get away from. Or I've got to have some of. Um, and uh, to be able to to know that as a, a a movement, a wave of feeling in the mind, and to know that. Uh, you know that, that craving, that that desire, is a lie. It's not. It's not the. It's not the truth. It's not the whole story. It's just a a, a, a mental impulse. And then when we we are able to see that and to say, "Oh, this is a feeling. It's a strong feeling, but it is just a feeling." Then in that moment, we find the the way to to free the heart from that. So uh, um, the the last part of things this evening uh, will be the formal taking of the the eight precepts. So uh, in a little bit we'll we'll, we'll do that all together. Um, but I would like I would really encourage people to 
try to relate to the the precepts uh, as we take them uh, in this way and to see them as a they create a, a very firm and supportive structure for the retreat time and to, to help create a a, a most sort of fertile and helpful environment for the for the practice but i would uh, strongly encourage you learning to use them or, or actively using them in this way to help uh, develop the quality of, of uh, mindfulness uh, really bringing a careful attention to those movements of like and dislike the uh, the uh, the uh, sort of reactions of uh, self-centered concern you know that uh, uh, when your territory is invaded you know someone's moved your cushion or <laughs> taken your you know, taken your chanting book or uh, rearranged your bedding <laughs> or sitting in your seat in the uh, in the, the the dining room you know whatever it might be whether it's in terms of territory or a desire object or an, an object of aversion or to be to be uh, uh picking those up and say ah oh, yes, this is what this is, is this is the mind moving towards that and and trying to get absorbed so in that learning to recognize oh this is a feeling of liking and the mind is trying to run away with it or this is a feeling of disliking and the mind is trying to run away with it. So at that very moment, you're looking at the bridge between feeling and craving, between Vedana and Tanha. And uh, and and we'll address this again and again during the next uh, 10 days, that that is the, the most helpful place to bring our attention. Because when we can recognize, oh, this is a feeling of dislike, this is a feeling of like, that's all. We don't have to follow it. We don't have to to uh, run away from it. We can know this is a this is a, just a feeling, and so that's like coming to the bridge, <laughs> and choosing not to cross it. You see, you're coming to the to the that, that bridge and recognizing yes, this is a strong feeling or this is very compelling, but I don't have to cross this bridge, and that's a tremendous freedom. That is an incredible power of freedom that we have to 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 make that choice. And essentially, um, this is how we can free ourselves from the, the cycles of rebirth, the cycles of, of addiction, is essentially uh, to be able to uh, to recognize that that dynamic and to, to recognize this is a this is a bridge here, <laughs> and that the uh, the choice that we can make to to not cro to not cross that to, to not enter into um, uh, absorbing uh, into that to not enter it to not pick it up and follow it and uh, the um, hopefully during this time together we'll uh, be looking at that not just as a theory or as a uh, as a, um, a kind of conceptual pattern but also training ourselves using this time to learn the skills of, of coming to the to the end of the bridge and recognizing I have a choice here <laughs> Uh, I have a, there's a choice, and let's choose uh, to uh, to not cross that bridge, to not let the 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 mind get absorbed into craving and clinging, becoming, and then to directly experience the the freedom and peacefulness, the the joyfulness that that comes from that. So I'll leave the reflections on this opening evening uh, at that point. So uh, we can maybe have a little bit more light so people can uh, read more easily. So the eight precepts, um, the formal requesting of the three refuges and the eight precepts is found on page 59. So uh, uh, I would encourage the, those who are familiar with uh, the, the chanting of the refuges and precepts to give full voice and uh, to um, give that um, the, uh, yeah, the uh, sort of, uh, it's a, uh, say, full commitment through your vo vocal cords and those who are unfamiliar with the Pali and it's uh, you're struggling to, to form the words just sort of tag along behind <laughs> but uh, uh, the main thing is not the the word the, the precise words or the pronunciation but more the sense of commitment and say this is the structure this is the form that we're 
choosing to undertake during this time. And this is also not just to support your own practice, but also it's a gift to the others that you share the time with. That the the uh, uh, the the uttering of the of the the words is one thing, but the the more the commitment in the heart is the is the most important element of that. So when you're ready, if you'd like to begin by bowing three times and then uh, start with a request. I'll repeat the Namotasa three times, and then after I finish the third time, then we will do that together. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang Sarananga Chami Tamang Sarananga Chami Sanghang Sarananga Chami Dutiambi Buddhang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi tamang sarananga chami. Dutiampi tamang sarananga chami. Dutiampi sanghang sarananga chami. Dutiampi sanghang sarananga chami. Tatiampi buddhang sarananga chami. Tatiampi buddhang sarananga chami. Tatiampi dhamang sarananga chami. Tatiampi dhamang sarananga chami. Tatiampi sanghang sarananga chami. Tatiampi sanghang sarananga chami. Ti saranagamanang nititang. Panati pata. Where up money, Sika Padang Samadiami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adinadana. Where up money, Sika Padang Samadiami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Abrahma Charya, 
Vairapmanisikaparangsamadiyami I undertake the precept to refrain from any intentional sexual activity. Musa vadaha verapmani sikha parang samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura meraya majapamadatana Verapmani sikha padang samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Vikala bhojana verapmani sikha parang samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from eating at inappropriate times. Nacha gita vadita visugarasana Mala Ganda Vilepana Dharana Mandana Vibhusana Tana Verapmani Sika Padang Samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from entertainment, beautification and adornment. Ucha sayana maha sayana verapmani sikha padang samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from lying on a high or luxurious sleeping place. Imani atta sika padani samadhyami. Imani atta sikha padani silena suga dingyanti silena voga sambara silena nebu dingyanti tasama silang viso taye So in these precepts, as I'm sure has been explained to you, the um, the uh, Musawada, the fourth precept, is uh, expanded, developed uh, into uh, refraining from uh, any kind of um, any kind of speech. Uh, so that refraining from from conversation. So uh, when there's a time to have the interviews, um, then obviously you're uh, welcome to ask questions then. Or if we have an open time for questions and answers, then um, then yeah free to, to raise your questions vocally at that time, but otherwise to restrain the uh, action of speech. And um, also uh, the, uh, the uh, eighth precept of refraining from lying on a high or luxurious sleeping place, I would encourage that to be uh, understood. You can, can, again, develop that or extend that into being content with the, the living place that you, you have. 
um, your particular spot, if you haven't got the, your favorite bed in the dorm, <laughs> or that the other person's got the window that you want, or you know you should have, and just to use the precept to be content with, uh, with the um, dwelling place, the sleeping place uh, that uh, you've been granted, and be to, uh, say, cultivate a sense of gratitude to have a roof over the head for one night, and uh, the uh, shelter of this uh, fine retreat center uh, accommodations uh, for this period. I think there was something else I was supposed to... Uh, ah, cell phones, yes. <laughs> that was the other um, element of right speech. So part of right speech is also not receiving other people's speech. <laughs> so I uh, would uh, uh, vigorously encourage anybody who has still got a, a cell phone to um, put it into the care of our good retreat managers. Um, uh, just for maintaining your own sense of sanctuary and uh, to help sort of preserve a, a, a kind of supportive and helpful environment um, so that uh, you don't get tweeted accidentally or uh, you have uh, text messages coming in or emails or, or uh, phone calls arriving just to uh, just take your phone and quietly put it into the hands of the managers and just to be ungettable for 10 days. <coughs> This is a, a rarer and rarer uh, possibility in the in the world. Solitude is almost uh, unheard of nowadays. We're, the, the, to be in a, a situation where you are, where you can't be reached, where you can be alone, you can turn your attention inward is uh, is rare, and and uh, would encourage people to take advantage of this opportunity as fully as possible. So. Uh, do uh, do avail yourself of that, and uh, you have our uh, firm. Vigorous encouragement <laughs> to uh, to park your phones with the managers, and uh, they'll they'll happily give them back to you at the end. And if you do need to make an emergency call for some reason, um, then the office here has a telephone, and you can request the use of that. If there's some uh, uh, unforeseen or emergency situation, then the phone is is there, and the lines work. So uh, don't uh, don't worry that you won't be able to communicate if it's absolutely essential. So another desire object to be contemplating.